Okay. Well, um, welcome everybody to uh, the beginning of the seventh and final module of, of this fantastic two-week course that, that Olga has, has put together for several years running now. And um, this year, she asked us to put together something new, uh, a, a so-called capstone um, module. And the capstone is something that is pretty unique to, to Northeastern. It's an idea that you have some component of your education that puts together everything that you've learned up till now. And uh, hopefully, um, by going through these case studies in, in quantitative proteomics, largely based around the experience in, in my own laboratory, uh, we'll touch on many of the topics that you've covered so far. My name is Jake Jaffe. I'm the Associate Director of Proteomics at the Broad Institute, which is just across the river in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and we've been working for some years now on, on targeted proteomics and discovery proteomics and, and many aspects of proteomics. Um, but uh, it, it's been a real, a real fun challenge to put together this course. I wanted to share with you uh, some of the goals that, that I have for this course going in. So um, what I hope you'll get out of this is, is to understand uh, the concepts and the value of a, of a proteomics sentinel assay. Uh, Rudy just did a fantastic job of explaining how it's better to do more samples than it is to, to have more analytes, and I think sentinel assays fit into the sweet spot. The second thing is to understand the considerations from moving from discovery proteomics paradigms uh, into targeted proteomics. Um, and then we're going to have a sort of a, a practical exercise, which is starting from a, a fairly large discovery data set, how to select probes for a targeted proteomic uh, sentinel assay. Third is to understand the, the considerations for treatment and normalization of, of what I'll call research-grade targeted proteomic data, and we'll, we'll talk more about what that means tomorrow. But um, you know, something that, that I think will be a very valuable exercise is to have you work on constructing your own data normalization and, and outlier detection pipeline sort of in, in real time. Uh, Jarrett Eggertson will give a, a, a lecture about an introduction to, to next generation um, proteomic techniques, which uh, Rudy has already actually done. Uh, and whether you want to call it DIA or SWATH or, or HRM, Jarrett will go a little bit more in depth about the kind of the state of the art of, of, the, of that technology. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about understanding the conceptual differences between using specific markers versus entire profiles of measurements uh, of activity. And uh, Lev Litachevsky is also here from the Broad Institute. He's there in the back. Um, and I've brought him along to, to uh, help explain how well, some of our thoughts on, on that subject. And he will also go on to introduce the, the concepts of, of connectivity. And that's how we think we like to, to analyze these profile types of data and explore the data sets that we've generated a little bit uh, in, the, in the space of, of connectivity. Okay. So there's a few, I think, key differences from the previous modules in which you may have participated. So the first and foremost is that you're, you are all guinea pigs. This is the first time that we have attempted this course. Uh, so expect some bumps in the road, and your feedback will be tremendously valuable at the end of it. And we, uh, you know, we may end up adjusting some things on the fly, uh, even if necessary. And now the, the second thing that's different is rather than having specific exercises for you to complete in a given software suite uh, with, with a set of instructions and tasks, we are going to um, have what I call hackathons, or what are commonly known as hackathons. We're going to, um, hopefully, you'll be have the chance now to put into practice all that you've learned so far, and we'll form you up into, into small groups. Um, I, I sincerely believe that really the key learning, the key steps of learning is from sharing the experiences with one another. And so hopefully by having you work together in these groups, you can all learn from each other. And then as we discuss the sort of results of your individual group uh, efforts, we can really all learn together. There are no right or wrong answers in any of these hackathons. Each of you will, or each of your groups will come up with, with potential answers. We'll take a look at them, we'll compare them, and we'll kind of see what, what happens. I think it's going to be a lot of, a lot of fun. So um, uh, the course structure um, is here. Uh, basically, we're going to spend today talking about the introduction to the Sentinel assay concept and, and how we went about it, uh, and then we'll start our first hackathon. 
we'll uh, continue the hackathon in, in the morning hour, um, and then we'll get together to sort of compare and contrast our, our different approaches. We'll uh, follow then the discussion of an assay that we've generated called P100. It's a sentinel phosphoproteomic assay. We'll have another hackathon around that, building your own data normalization pipelines. Um, we'll have a, a fantastic lecture from Mike McCoss about uh, sort of proteomic data ecosystems and, and how we can bring and utilize proteomic data um, really at a, at a very large scale and share it with the community and then get past the sort of um, some of the, 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 the foibles of proteomics and out into the world of data science. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Jarrett will talk about, um, um, about next generation techniques. Uh, we have a little bit of flex time here. I'm hoping to actually get feedback directly from some of the other course organizers on what we've done so far. But if we need to take some more time to, to work on our hackathon projects, we can do that as well. And then um, Lev will, will speak about connectivity. We'll have another, uh, what I'm sure will be amazing, address from Rudy at the end to sort of all wrap it up. Everything that you need and everything that you see for this course is, will be easily uh, obtainable at this very hopefully simple uh, URL, bit.ly PCCSE data. And if you just navigate down in the, in the uh, menu there to any U Capstone course, you'll find all of the slide decks, you'll find all the source data, you'll find all of the code, um, which you are free to, to use however you like. Okay, so um, with that organization, uh, sort of organizing principle, do you have any questions there before I sort of get into the, the first lecture? Okay, great. And this is also meant to be interactive, so please, um, you know, ask questions, interrupt uh, throughout the, the talk uh, as you see fit. Okay, so the, the first topic is about um, targeted proteomics. We heard a little bit about it. The uh, concept of a sentinel assay. Um, and then the initial development of, of this P100 phosphoproteomic assay. So just to briefly remind, um, Rudy did a, a great job of, of explaining in some detail what the differences between discovery or, or shotgun proteomics and targeted proteomics are. But uh, basically, just a, a quick reminder in this, these shotgun or discovery experiments, we take a complex sample and it's interrogated basically stochastically at the whim of the mass spec instrumentation and whatever onboard data algorithms tell it to select peptides for sequencing and generation of MSMS spectra. Um, and so the idea here is that you're getting peptide IDs, which are then reconstructed into uh, inferred protein IDs. Uh, but as we learned already, repeats are, are irreproducible, even from sample to sample. Uh, whereas in targeted proteomics, we're going to focus on relatively few analytes and we use it, uh, we use a technique to more verify the identification of something that we want to measure, and then at the same time get extremely good quantitative measurements on that given analyte. And the, the key word here is consistency, right? Every time that we, we execute the assay, we expect to be able to measure the same analytes, uh, even if there are many, many samples. How does this sort of functionally work in, inside of a mass spectrometer? And this may be the only mass spec slide I have planned for the entire, <laughs> <laughs> the entire lecture series, which I'm sure some of you are, are pretty happy about, maybe others of you are bummed about. But um, the, the idea of, of, of targeted mass spectrometry is to use the instrument more as a filtering device rather than a, uh, um, a discovery device. And so, uh, as you know, most experiments that happen today are, are LCMS experiments, and so uh, a mixture of peptides is separated over a column and then sprayed into the instrument over the course of, of one experiment. And if you were to simply sum up all of the intensity that came from all these peptide analytes at any given time, but plot it in profile across the length of the experiment, you might see some kind of blah signal like this. And this is just the sort of total ion current of all analytes that have entered the mass spectrometer over the course of an experiment. Now, if we know what it is that we're looking for, and we've seen it before, we can know what the mass to charge of that particular peptide or analyte. It could be a metabolite. It could be anything. We know what it is. And so we can use um, the filtering capabilities of, of a mass spectrometer, which um, might be through the use of a quadrupole, um, to 
put on blinders to everything else except that thing that we care deeply about. Uh, now, when we do that, we might see a sort of reduction in complexity of the signal, and you might see some, some distinct peaks emerge from that, that big gamish uh, of signal, but it's still not enough. And so what, why is this? It's because there may be many peptides that have the same or, or extremely similar uh, mass-to-charge ratios that come out during the course of this experiment, and um, the resolving power of a quadrupole or, or most other isolation techniques is really not enough to get you just the one thing uh, that you care about. So then, um, just like in a shotgun experiment, we can break the, the peptides apart. Now we're only breaking apart things that have the right starting mass to charge. Uh, and then we have this, this um, nice trick of looking for not only the right fragments that belong to that peptide, but the coincident detection of all those fragments. Again, we know what we're looking for. We know what, what fragments we expect to be there in the mass spectrum. So when we see the coincident detection of them at the same time, coupled with the fact that we're sitting on the right starting mass to charge, we can literally pull this needle of this analyte out of this haystack of, of sort of gamish of data. And the nice thing here is you don't do it just one at a time, but you do it in parallel, which enables you to analyze hundreds of different <coughs> peptides or analyze in, in the same experiment. You can gain further uh, advantages if you know during what point in the experiment the peptides are, are expected to be seen. And so you can schedule the specific acquisition windows around your targeted set of analytes. So sort of in summary, we get hundreds of analytes in a single experiment. There is an opportunity here, again, because we know what we're looking for, we want to focus on certain things to introduce um, standards for everything that, that we want to measure. And so we can put synthetic peptide standards in there. That's another sort of double check on the proof of identification of the thing that you're looking at. And it gives you a sort of fundamental basis for, for quantification if you can generate a ratio to that internal standard. And it's really the techniques of technique of choice when you want to measure an analyte each and every time you execute the experiment. So why why to choose this? I think this has largely largely been been covered already. You know the the current instrumentation is not super fast. It's not super sensitive, and it has a, a certain dynamic range limitation. So that if you simply injected the same sample twice in a row uh, in a typical LCMS setup, you would probably see on the order of about two thirds overlap. Uh, between the uh, um, identified peptides and proteins that, that you saw from experiment to experiment. Uh, the, the sort of, uh, this, this suite of next-gen MS te techniques, which I like to call comprehensive MS, because that's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to sample everything in the entire population, is an emerging solution to this problem, and I think we've seen it employed to great power. Uh, but when we want to have extreme sort of sensitivity on a very focused set of analytes, our, our choice for, for the moment would be a, a specific targeted assay. Okay. Um, we talked about a little bit about missing data problem, or Rudy talked a little bit about the missing data problem. And so, um, you know, my, my main sort of take home point from this is that if we do these shotgun experiments, we get these kind of holy what I call holy data matrices or, or missing values. And I think it's, it's hard to be holy, right? It's hard to be holy in, in, in any setting, but it's especially hard to be uh, holy um, when you want to interact with data scientists. And so I'm really, I'm really intrigued because we have a group here of, of, of sort of experimentalists who are used to this kind of holy data. Um, and then we've got a group of data scientists here who would prefer that it not be, I'm assuming. <laughs> because there are a lot of very cool techniques that one can do that just don't tolerate missing values uh, very well. Um, and so um, I, I always aspire that my data is unholy, uh, if you will. Um, right. Okay, so with that said, like so... Uh, if we want to have uh, unholy data and we want to um, be able to measure things in every sample every time, we and, and if we're not quite ready for these comprehensive MS techniques because we're, we're just not quite, quite there yet, um, how can we best focus our efforts to, in data acquisition? And so with this comes the idea of the sentinel assay. The idea of a sentinel assay is that you pick some set of analytes that you want to report on that are going to reflect bioactivity or phenotypic activity uh, of any sort, and we're going to focus on measuring them. 
And I absolutely can take zero credit for inventing the, this idea. Um, in fact, it came out, it came from um, Paola Picotti, who was in fact trained by Rudy, trained in Rudy's lab and now has her own group. And so she published this fantastic paper on a sentinel assay, a, sent, a mass spec based sentinel assay that is very useful in, in yeast biology. And so um, since, since she ha is the first to coin this phrase, which I love, sentinel, sentinel assay, um, I'm going to just uh, read from her definition of, of what, this, what this is. Um, so the approach we describe here is based on the concept of sentinel proteins that report on the activation state of specific biological processes and are selected on the basis of literature evidence or computational prediction. And so I want to spend a few moments, uh, I'm, I'm again taking a page from Rudy's book and I'm presenting work that's not mine, but this is really the foundational work, I think, in, in the field. Um, and so in, in this paper, they actually configured two targeted proteomics assays focused again on yeast. One was for specific proteins, it was really for peptides that reported on specific proteins. And then a second one was on phosphopeptides, which as you'll discover are near and dear to my heart. Um, these um, analytes were chosen to sort of characterize a range of different biological responses to a, um, a set of stimuli that you would care about if you were studying yeast biology. And um, they had, they went to great lengths. In fact, I've, I've spoken with the, the first author of this paper, Martin, several times. A lot of time was spent simply combing literature and databases to find the right reporters for the, the processes that they wanted to report on. And so they picked uh, different sets of reporters, some that would sort of describe various pathway activities in, in yeast, and this could be a protein or a phosphoprotein. They picked a set of reporters for distinct transcription factors that would measure the level of transcription factors. Uh, they picked a set of reporters for specific kinase substrate relationships, and for this they monitored certain distinct phosphopeptides. And then they picked another set of reporters for some of the environmental conditions that yeast might encounter uh, out in the wild or in the lab and become adapted to, and so they could measure if, if, um, if the yeast themselves were sort of changing their states in response to a perturbation that would indicate an adaptive sort of phenotype. So with that in mind, as I mentioned, they went through the literature and databases and did a, 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 ton of, um, a ton of sort of pre-work before they ever touched the, the mass spectrometer, uh, ended up with a list of candidate sentinels, went ahead and configured a targeted proteomic assay using um, the, the, their own prior knowledge in, in synthetic peptides of, of which analytes to look at, and then ultimately ended up with uh, two relatively compact assays, which you can think about, I think it's useful to think about it like this, if each peak in the sort of elution profile of the, of the assay is a single peptide, they can sort of point to this peak and say this one and this one sort of reflect <laughs> mTOR signaling, or TOR, uh, probably isn't as clear, and I, mTOR is yeast, so this is TOR, and some other peaks um, look at DNA damage, some other peaks might read out on MAP kinase pathway, some on lipid synthesis, et cetera. So it's the idea that you get all, all these sort of markers, again, literature determined, uh, all in the price of one. And because it's targeted, you should be able to mon monitor them very um, efficiently and reproducibly. Okay. So uh, just a, as an example, and all these, these figures and data are from Paolo's paper, here's an example of a sentinel peptide that uh, is, is a, a, um, a readout for heat shock activation, and it's measuring at the protein level now, um, or meaning not phosphopeptide rich, a peptide from HSP82. And so you can see here that uh, under normal conditions, it's levels fairly low. If you shock the yeast um, with heat for 30 minutes, the magnitude of this grows, and then at 60 minutes, it grows even further. And then if you measure um, what happens to it after removal of the heat shock condition, it sort of is going down and starting to return um, back to baseline. This is a sort of adapted state. Okay. Um, Here's an example of a very specific uh, phosphopeptide that's used in a marker. And this is um, a, a downstream readout of TOR activation in, in yeast. It's a specific phosphopeptide on, on ribosomal protein 6. And you can see that uh, under control conditions now, 
this case, um, the signal is fairly high. And when you inhibit the activity of the TOR complex with a drug called rapamycin, uh, it suitably goes down, which is sort of what you would expect in this case. So these are specific analytes, specific markers that you can look here. But what I, what I think is, is also quite interesting are the entire profiles of markers. So um, they had picked a, a whole set of, of markers uh, that should report out on thermal tolerance, and most of the, or all of these are now uh, peptides that report on the whole protein abundance here. And what you can see um, is that under heat shock conditions, this is heat shock for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and that recovery, just like in, in the prior slide, most of these markers, which um, are thought to go up, this little this little arrow indicates the direction in which the analyte is thought to to move in response to the the desired stimulus. Most of them do, in fact, go up. And they had another interesting uh, set of markers that they thought would go up, but in fact go down with heat shock. So um, sometimes uh, you can actually learn something uh, about biology that might differ from, from the literature curated idea of what these things are supposed to do in, in cells. And so I think these are good, um, these are probably fantastic sentinels for heat shock. It's just that they're annotated originally in the, in the wrong direction. And so now through something like this, you can actually correct that, that annotation. And then there's a nice, um, a nice kind of suite of phospho level reporters that, that read out on different pathways, a set of, of kinase substrates, particularly uh, on YAC1 here, uh, protein kinase A, TOR complex activation and, and autophagy. And here, um, the, the stimulations that should be affecting these markers are all sort of to the, to the right here, rapamycin, uh, nutrient starvation, and, um, and growth and stationary phase. Uh, and here it's a little bit more kind of scattershot as to the expected behavior uh, versus the, the observed behavior. Um, and so uh, what I would argue is that it's probably this entire profile of, of sentinel behaviors that is really the key uh, typifier of the of the phenotypic response in, in the cells rather than relying on any any one in particular okay so um, that th that really again as I mentioned is the kind of foundational work here uh, and it was done in yeast and there's a ton of biology done in yeast um, but uh, I was very interested in applying the same kind of concept in a, in a human model. So there are, I think there are several considerations for translating something like this into a, a human sentinel assay. So first of all, the human proteome and phosphoproteome is, is somewhat bigger than it is in yeast. Um, the pathway architecture in human cells is probably more complex and less well understood. I think we have a, a much harder time of picking out the very specific um, things that we wanted to monitor because we don't quite understand all the wiring and, and connections of, of human pathways. And even in the case where we do know what we want to look at, they're not always uh, accessible to proteomic techniques. For, for example, one might like to look at the, the activation loops of kinases and the phosphorylation state. These often reside in very acidic regions of the protein, which are not amenable to the kind of cryptic digestion uh, workflows that we use to get peptides. And so it can be very hard to observe the peptides that you want to observe. Um, and then uh, a, a sort of above and beyond that, uh, and it, I, thought it, I thought it was telling that some of the, the primary separations in, in data analysis that we really showed were by cell line. Uh, that seemed to be a driving factor in several of the, the convolutions of data analysis that he showed. Um, there's such a diversity of biology, even at the cell line level in, in human cells, it makes it kind of hard to pick things that, that are, are universal. Um, so we approach this, this challenge in, in, a, in a different way. And so we have a, a different kind of sentinel assay. We call it P100. It is a reduced representation phosphosignaling assay. So let me take one little aside and say, why do we care so much about phosphoproteins? So classically, pathways are kind of represented in these, these cascade diagrams. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And often, what, what the connections between them mean are passing of, of phosphorylation signals from one kinase to a substrate 
which may in fact be a kinase, but so, which uh, phosphorylates something else. So we wanted to have this sort of way of, of interrogating these, these cascaded responses. Second thing is that uh, phosphoproteomic events of the signaling are, are what I would call the kind of first responders of a cell. They can change extremely quickly on the order of seconds or minutes, but their responses can also be durable for days. Uh, and so they're, I think they're exquisitely sensitive to changes in the, in the cellular state. Um, the third thing is uh, phospho, the phosphoproteome is simply not something that you can look at easily with nucleic acid-based techniques. And I feel that proteomics needs to play to its strengths. So post-translational modifications on proteins is certainly a strength of, of proteomics. I hope we can all uh, sort of agree on that one. And then um, finally, uh, kinase inhibitors uh, or drugs related to disrupting signaling are really a major class of emerging therapeutics. And so for all these reasons, we wanted to have something that would sort of report on the, on the state of, of the phosphoproteome in, in human cells. Uh, we know that we could not look at all, I think there are like 200,000 sites in Phosphocyte Plus or something like that, and that's untenable. If there are you know, 14,000 proteins, maybe we can get there with comprehensive MS, but 200,000 Phosphocytes, that's, that's probably a tall order uh, for anyone. But I think there's some good news here, and I think that you know, phospho signaling is, re is really likely coordinated in cells. So, for these 200,000 phosphocytes, there are only on the order of 1,000 annotated kinases and phosphobases encoded in the genome. So the kinase to substrate relationship must be one to many. Uh, and there's this kind of a priori expectation that phosphocytes will be coordinately regulated. So that raises the question, do we really need to monitor every phosphocyte all the time? Or can we pick some smaller set of phosphocytes that are the sentinels or the, the, the kind of canaries in the coal mine of the phosphoproteome and take this reductionist approach to make a compact assay panel? Okay. So we set out with these goals in mind. We wanted an assay that would report on drug responses. We want it to be universal, and I say ish because uh, we want it to be responsive to a broad range of biological models, and we know that we're probably not going to cover them all, but we wanted to make sure that we cover some fair amount of them. We wanted to make, uh, make the assay serine and threonine phosphorylation focused because something like 80 to 90 percent of all phosphocytes are annotated at these two amino acids, whereas just a very small percentage are annotated at tyrosine uh, sites. Now, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are a huge class of drug right now, but um, the, their sort of target substrates constitute a real minority of the phosphoproteome. We wanted to kind of look in this un, not undiscovered, but maybe understudied country of, of serine and threonine phosphorylation. We wanted the assay to be compact. Um, we wanted to operate at scale, not looking at dozens of samples, but looking at hundreds and thousands of samples. Uh, and we wanted results that we obtained in this assay to be longitudinally comparable um, over days, weeks, months, and years. So immediately we encountered the kind of first major problem is that there was no, no easily usable prior data on which to draw for constructing an assay of this, this type. There are, of course, tons of, of piecemeal kind of ad hoc drug studies with human phosphoproteomic readouts, um, but maybe it was a couple of drugs. Most of them focused in, on tyrosine signaling or, or application of tyrosine kinases. Um, they were in a heterogeneous uh, range of biological models. It was just physically difficult to gather data from all these things. I'm sure anyone who's done any kind of data mining knows that half of, half of the battle, or maybe more than half of the battle, is this kind of um, data wrangling gymnastics that one has to do to get everything into, into a common format before you can even analyze anything. Um, and, and given this sort of lack of systematic studies, we decided to make our own data. So. In fact, the story is going to start with discovery proteomics, which I just told you you should all forget about. But we're going to start there. Okay. Uh, and we're going to do this, and we're going to use a type of quantitation technique called SILAC, which I'll explain in a few moments. But how did we, how did we even start? So we wanted to pick a range of drugs now with which to perturb cells. And so we actually started from transcriptomic data, another group at the Broad Institute had had generated a fairly large 
um, amount of transcriptional profile data that was in response to drug perturbation. They used a variety of cell, cell line models. Um, and so we took these data, these were done on, on AFI arrays, it was some time ago, but we took these, these data and we extracted all the genes that belong to kinases and phosphatase. And we looked for drugs in their perturbation set that showed a systematic uh, sort of elevation or repression of kinase and phosphatase genes with, under the assumption that if we could perturb the level of a kinase or phosphatase, it should have a pretty pleiotropic effect on the phosphoproteome itself. We wanted to know what are the easily modulated phosphopeptide substrates in the, in the phosphoproteome. So um, after sort of analyzing the transcriptomic data a little bit and, and we, we clustered it, uh, we were able to extract a pretty small set of perturbogens that we thought would, would do, do the job. And so this was the idea. We would take um, three different models of biology, MCF7 cells, which is a breast cancer cell line, PC3 cells, which is a prostate cancer cell line, and HL60 cells, which is a, 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 an APML cell line or a leukemia cell line. And this is sort of important because the, the, the serological can or the hematological cancers are sort of different than the solid tumor cancers. And this sort of gets to the point of being able to probe a wide range of, of biology. And so in complete biological duplicate, we had uh, 26 different drugs that we treated them with. And here was the idea is that we would simply do this nice um, phosphoproteome discovery experiment. We would be able to cluster the data uh, by cell lines and conditions, and we'd be able to see these nice contiguous blocks of, of phosphocytes that behaved in a coordinated ma and manner. And you know, so of course that, that was the idea. Uh, before we show what happened, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the quantification technique that we use called, called SILAC. Was that, um, well, I, e either way. So, so SILAC is a, is a sort of clever way of uh, generating internal standards um, for oneself or, or being able to, in fact, multiplex samples by uh, letting cells metabolically label proteins with heavy amino acids. So what we did in this case is to uh, feed cells with, with growth medium that had extra, um, uh, on two key amino acids, lysine and, and arginine, they had um, heavy atoms, N15, C13, and so all the proteins made in those cells naturally get heavier, right? Because one thing a mass spectrometer is good at is telling things apart that are heavy and light. And so you can discriminate these things uh, inside of a mass spectrometer. Uh, but otherwise, they're, they're sort of the same. So we took this approach. We had sort of three batches of cells, light, medium, and heavy cells. In the light cells, we, um, we treated those with, with DMSO, which is a vehicle for all the compounds. In the medium cells, we treated them with, with one compound. And in the heavy cells, we treated with, a number comp uh, with another compound. So we had uh, numerous trios of, like this that were run sort of over the course uh, of the entire experiment. Once you do this, the nice thing is you can mix all these protein lysates together. The proteins have already been labeled. You digest them, you do the typical proteomic workflow, and then do this kind of phosphopeptide enrichment step here. And then you quantify based on the, the precursor intensity of the peptides that, that you've identified. And so by comparing the different channels, the light, medium, and heavy channels, you can uh, extract full changes for any given uh, analyte. Okay, so uh, we treated each of these cells for, for six hours with these drugs. We wanted to match the conditions from that gene expression study that we had taken the data from because we wanted to compare to that uh, at the end of the day. Okay. So we, we also started out with a kind of ser series of questions that we, we figured we had to be able to answer satisfactorily to see if we'd been successful in, in this effort. So uh, first of all, we needed to find out, are there, is there some set of phosphocytes that we can almost always observe under a range of conditions in biological models? We had to find sites that did stuff. They were modulated in response to these drug perturbations that we hope to project uh, out into a, a deeper assay. And importantly, we had to ask the question, could we gain anything over gene expression measurements by, by having done this? And this was a, a sort of a tricky question. Um, if all those things are true, could we then go ahead and pick a small set of phosphopeptides, configure an assay, um, which is not trivial, and if we ran that assay on the same conditions or, or, or similar conditions, could we reproduce the observations of this deep-oriented experiment? And then 
could we go on to prove the assay's general utility, not having trained an assay for the detection of these 26 drugs, but having generated an assay that um, will be broadly useful in, in the field. Okay. Um, just a kind of quick schematic of, of, how, of how the experiment worked. All the, all the drug treatments happened uh, over the course of, of seven weeks for collection of these um, different cell lines. And so independent cell growth, independent treatments for each of the cell lines, uh, expansion of cells, and, and in each there, there were 13 trios at each sort of block here. So we grew on the order of a billion cells for, for these experiments, which is not terribly many, but it's a lot for a proteomics lab. So, okay. And then we use this kind of uh, what I call computational fractionation acquisition strategy to be able to get the most out of each of these, these samples. Um, we did not want to divide all these, um, these samples into multiple fractions biochemically because it would just take inordinately long to analyze all these samples. But we could maybe run each sample a few times uh, with the, the, the time and instrument availability that we had. So, the first time that we analyze each sample, we just do your typical shotgun proteomics experiment where the top 12 most intense ions were selected and we got what we got. Then we, ran, we analyzed those data and ran the sample a second time with a, a technique called Amex, uh, where you explicitly um, tell the instrument not to sequence anything that it sequenced in the first run. Right? So now we're trying to get deeper into the dynamic range of, of each sample. Then we analyzed uh, sort of these runs one and two together, and we, we looked at the data matrix to try to see where the holes were in the data matrix, and went back and configured, now for each sample, a kind of specific acquisition strategy uh, that was designed to fill in the holes in the matrix wherever possible. So we use another technique called AIMS, or Accurate Inclusion Mass Screening, to do that. So, um, uh, so hopefully we would have, even from discovery data, uh, and as unholy matrix as, as possible. So, you know, I showed you that cartoon of the perfect little blocks and everything that it's supposed to look like. This is what it actually looked like. Um, and I, I've sort of flipped the axis from that, that figure. So here we have 156 different uh, SILAC or, uh, or different treatments along, along this axis here. And then on the order uh, in this particular representation, of about um, 1,400 different phosphocytes. So all in all, there are over 10,000 phosphocytes detected in, in the study, but some of them were detected in one sample or two samples, which is not really useful for this idea of being able to see it in lots of, of different places. Uh, and the, what we took as encouraging was that over 1,200 sites were present in at least three quarters of all the samples. Uh, so not too bad for um, uh, shotgun proteins. Again, this spans three different models of biology, so that we, we thought maybe some of these things might be totally absent in one cell type or another. So I think we can answer affirmatively. Um, there, there's a, a set of phosphocytes that we can, we can almost always uh, observe, this sort of low-hanging fruit of the, of the phosphoprotein. So do these things do anything interesting? Treat them with drugs. I mean, you, you can see here there's there's clearly some structure in this data when you just uh, do simple hierarchical clustering. But we want to look a little bit deeper here, and so here's an example of, of a cluster. Now the axes are flipped back. So along the top here we have um, the different drug treatments. Um, there, there are bio reps are indicated by the kind of suffix on each one of these drug treatments, and the cell line model in which the experiment was done is in, is in here, and so. Um, here you can see a class of, of phosphocytes, this sort of block of coordinated activity that seems to indicate responsiveness to pa paclitaxel or taxol. Um, and in fact, MCF7 is an estrogen responsive breast cancer cell line, so we expected there would be some response here. And what we were um, sort of surprised by is that there's a universal response um, to paclitaxel regardless of the lineage that you're from, even if you're from uh, PC3, or a prostate cancer cell line, you wouldn't necessarily expect that to be um, uh, um, estrogen sensitive or estrogen antagonist sensitive, and even in this hematological cell line here. And, and so we had some hope that you know, we could pick one of these things that would sort of be the general indicator of this sort of, of, of signaling activity in a 
cell without really putting a label on what that is. We could also uh, see some, some other things. We intentionally included, in cases, groups of structurally related compounds. We wanted to make sure that uh, they produced signatures that, uh, or profiles that could be recognized. Um, and so we, we use this series of, of cardiac glycosides. Um, digitalis is one, was one of the compounds that was a common heart medication and sort of many uh, uh, analogs of digitalis. And for the most part, we could see that the bio reps of these uh, related series of, of compounds all kind of clustered together. Um, we also noticed that this, this small antibiotic, an anisomycin, which has nothing to do uh, with a, a, as a cardiac medication, also co-clustered with the cardiac glycoside. We have no idea what this means. We actually went back and looked in the transcriptional data. In fact, it's present there, too. Um, so there, there may be some very real sort of phenotypic effect of this, this compound that is similar to the DPMs. But uh, then what we could start to see emerge in, in, in these data, beyond just being able to recognize structural analogs, is that there are components of the response in this case, to this class, that are independent of the cell line. Here we have MCF7 and PC3 cells sort of co-clustered together, and there's this block of phosphocytes, uh, maybe even down to here, that sort of all do the same thing. These guys go up, these guys go down. And then there's this other block of response that is specific to MCF7. So now we, we had a sense in the data that um, we could have both detect, detect both these kind of generic cell line or biology model independent responses, and then still be able to further stratify model specific responses by observing patterns um, like this. So uh, I think things sort of behave in, in interesting ways, which was, was the great hope that they would behave in interesting ways. So then we tried to figure out could we gain something? Uh, by measuring the phosphoproteome over over um, just doing simple gene expression me measurements. And so we, we had a sort of crude way of doing this, which I, I will try to explain. And when I say we, I mean someone who's really smart doing this sort of thing. Um, uh, what we did is we looked in, in, um, in the transcriptional data for all of the parent genes that belong to the phosphocytes that we were measuring. Because it could have just been an artifact of things going up or down. That simple, simply the level of that gene or protein happened to go up and down, and the and the phosphopeptide level does not actually change relative to the amount of uh, the total protein. So uh, we we borrowed a technique called from information theory called mutual information, and we looked to see how much mutual information for all of these conditions was there between the phosphocyte that we measured across all of these these samples and its parent gene. In, um, in the uh, transcriptional data. And so if they basically both told the story of one another and there was no, nothing added to gain, you would expect all of the points here uh, to, to sort of fall along this line where they have ma maximally overlapping mutual information. Um, but in fact, what we found, and this goes both ways, but I'm showing it here from the, the um, phosphopeptide probe. Sorry, I realize I'm right in your way there. Um, uh, is that uh, there is sort of excess entropy or excess bits of information in the in the phosphopeptide probe relative to their their genes in the transcriptional phase and vice versa. So there's something to be gained from doing phosphoproteomics and there's something to be gained from doing transcriptomics. By no means should we try to say one is better than the other. They both are clearly in, in the true information sense of the word contributing something. Yeah. Did you look? Did you compare the phosphoproteomics to? Um, well, no, because we don't know what the regulators are for most of the, the phosphocytes that we detect. We, we probably could have done a subset. We could have, we could have actually done something more in-depth and said not just take the parental genes, but is there some set of genes for which the mutual information is perfect, in which case uh, we would then conclude that we shouldn't do phosphoproteomics. But um, we couldn't really figure out how to, why we would do I'm that. Just thinking about Mm. I know they look they look within the transcription and then within the phosphorylation and phosphorylation uh, down the network, so to speak. Yes. I don't, I don't remember if they ever looked at across data sets. Yeah. 
and that's reassuring, right? But that's probably part of the part of the process for you. Certainly, the things that happen in the first minutes and and and, and hours after stimulus are not going to be transcriptionally governed. Yeah, you can expect some change in, in protein level. Um, six hour, and in fact, for future experiments that we have done, we've done basically things at, well, mostly three hours and earlier, because we do want to capture these kind of early events. They're, yeah, this is an age old question. You, you could spin it the other way. It's like, well, uh, you're measuring the sort of absolute number of molecules of the of the phosphopeptide or phosphoprotein has gone up, regardless of whether the protein has gone up or not. And that's probably an important cue to the cell as well. So you could argue you get two for the price of one in the phosphoprotein. Okay. So um, we think we can say that we gain something over gene expression. Um, as we can see. So then we sort of need to figure out how many of these thousands or so phosphopeptides should should we monitor? And so we tried a couple of techniques here. I, I'm sure you've probably talked about PCA earlier in the week. And uh, what we were aiming for there is we wanted to be able to recapture 80% uh, of the information with some number of probes, <coughs> some number of phosphopeptides here. And so uh, it turned out that um, you could capture about 80% of the variance with around 40 or something components. We did a, um, a second method um, that sort of suggested the number of, of independent clusters we need to monitor was around 50 or 55. Ultimately, we came to the, this notion that uh, there were 55 sort of clusters of activity that we needed to monitor. Now, this is totally different than the literature nominated, biologists nominated sentinel assay can't necessarily ascribe given activities to each of these clusters that we're going to measure. But it's through the, the comparison of profiles of these, these 55 sort of archetypal markers that, um, that we think there's a lot of insight to, to be gained. So we chose these 55 clusters. We started out by choosing two peptides for every cluster to have some redundancy. Because as we know, not every uh, peptide that you try to turn into a, a, um, a targeted proteomic assay always works or, or works well. Uh, and so ultimately, at the end of the day, we started with P110. And the real number is now P96. So it just sort of um, smooths down to, to P100. Or about <laughs> so, um, uh, and we, we, and this, so you're going to go through, uh, hopefully, a, 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 a hackathon later where you're going to pick your own set using whatever candidate you want. But I'll tell you the, the principles that we use, because you're not allowed to use these uh, for, for, for picking your set. The, the first thing is we wanted to have absolute localization of a phosphosite. So peptides that had only one possible phosphorylatable residue were considered the best. And so if you were a cluster member and you had only one serine in it, you were it. Um, the second thing is missed cuts, missed triptych cleavages. It would be better if there were fewer. Turns out that a lot of phosphocytes end up really close to, um, to lysines or, or with lesser frequency arginines. But um, the, sometimes the presence of a phospho group proximal to a trypsin cleavable site will prevent its cleavage. So we couldn't always avoid uh, missed cleavages. Uh, we didn't want to have residues that would be Otherwise, chemically modified, either through the, the process, uh, cysteines get derivatized in, in our regular workflow, and methionines are prone to oxidation just uh, as a course of, of doing business. Um, observability, we wanted to find peptides that we could see in all of the samples. So if you were seen in 156 out of 156 samples, that was good. Um, localization in the case where there was not just a single serine or threonine, uh, but the localization evidence for the site that was assigned was very strong. That was considered a bonus. Uh, and then a sort of final criteria tiebreaker was uh, the length, the overall length of, of the peptide. Shorter is better, down to some, some minimum number. And so we, we applied um, these, these things as a decision tree for picking representative, two representative peptides for each of the 55 clusters. And uh, 
just one small aside is in so doing, we went down from basically over a thousand um, to 55 archetypal probes with this 2x redundancy. And uh, there's, a, there's another sort of reduced representation assay in the transcriptional space that we practice at the Ed Road Institute called L1000, where they basically do the same thing on, for the genome. They say 20,000 genes and they compress that to 1,000 genes. The compression factor is 20 fold. We achieved almost exactly the same compression factor uh, from a, a larger phosphoproteomic data set down there. So, kind of small scale. Um, we looked at the ability of replicate recall for, for each probe, the sort of concordance of the probes that we took for, from each other uh, in bio reps for the same sample and compared that to any random probe. So what this means, and it's a little bit different from something that we'll get into um, later, is that for the probes we selected, there's consistency uh, of those probes in, in bio reps. So we, we felt pretty good and we thought it, it was going to work. Okay. Um, right. So that's uh, sort of where I wanted to, to end. I kind of wanted to end on a cliffhanger here. So that's everything that's going in. We've got to the point of, of, of having generated a large discovery data set and, and having picked probes. Uh, before we get to our first, first hackathon, I wanted to ask you know, if there's any questions. So uh, let me, uh, who knows what Cytoff is? Uh, oh, fair number. I guess it's gaining, gaining currency. So, so for those who don't know, um, Cytoff is uh, a single cell mass spectrometry based um, cell sorting technique. Or not cell sorting, but uh, cell counting technique because it destroys the cell in the process. But, so, so the idea is you have a flow cytometer which will separate single cells and then a typical flow cytometer, uh, you would label that cell with antibodies that um, have fluorophores on them. And the best flow cytometers, I think, do maybe 14 or 16 channels these days. And it's, it's, it's pretty. 30, 30. 30. Yeah. Are there 30 fluorophores with like the right Stokes shifts now? Because, uh, yeah. yeah. The, so, but um, Cytoff replaces the, the fluorescent detection with a mass spectrometer. And the antibodies, instead of having fluorophores on them, are doped with heavy metals, which have lots of different isotopic variants that, that you can use. Uh, and so what happens is as a center, as a cell enters uh, the sort of end capillary of, of the cell sorter, um, it gets pyrolyzed. Uh, and now all these heavy metals sort of ionize and fly off into the mass spectrometer. And you can really do this uh, from single cell. And, it, and it's pretty impressive amazing. A guy named Gary Nolan at Stanford has been a big proponent and developer of these te techniques. Um, now, it does mean that you need to have antibodies for all these things. Um, again, we picked all of these sites in a totally data-nominated way, not by looking at pathways. So the likelihood of us having antibodies to these things is pretty low. Um, so, and, and at the time that we did this, you know, Cytoff was just sort of emerging. So that's a long answer to say no, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Cytoff is a, is a cool and, and emerging technique worth, worth paying attention to. Any other questions? Yes, and you will hear about it on Friday. <laughs> um, but, but to give you a kind of sneak preview, uh, what we want to do is, is sort of combine, in fact, we're already doing this to a certain extent, the best of the targeted proteomics uh, panel with the best of the comprehensive proteomics techniques. The idea is that we have some set of analytes that we care deeply about that we do a very, very good job of quantifying. They can be used throughout a whole cohort of samples to help interpret some of the, the comprehensive uh, proteomic readouts that we're just now starting to be able to extract uh, from, from the data. So, and yeah, I'll, I, we'll, we'll definitely get into that. So, but we think 
that the number could be more like P3000, P6000, <laughs> somewhere in the three to 6000. Other questions? Uh, we certainly could. Um, we have another targeted proteome ex uh, assay panel that I'm not going to talk about this week, maybe a little bit, uh, uh, for histone modifications. Um, and so you can imagine looking at methylome and acetylome, um, ubiquitinome. Um, yeah, I think we're thinking about it. Is there a particular class of, of modification that you think is, is really burning for something like this? I think to be to be clear, uh, 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 it wouldn't be a combined assay with like phospho and ubiquitol and acetyl all in one assay panel. It would probably be a separate assay panel for each class of modification. I could definitely see kind of Again, there's an emerging class of drugs that are aimed at selectively degrading or preserving proteins that are often modulated by ubiquitin elimination events. And so having a panel against some key ubiquitin substrates might be kind of cool. Yeah? I was wondering if you would have the same list of other diseases models like that as research? Yes, we, we definitely have. Um, we, we already have. In fact, we have a large arm of experimentation that's focused on neurobiology, um, so, and ES cells and different genes of those cells in the neurobiology space. Yeah. <coughs> we'll, we'll talk about some of those later. Okay, so I think the way that this is set up is what I wanted to do was introduce the hackathon, and then there's a short break or something like that. Is there a short break? I'll go back to you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we could take a short break after I explain it, and then uh, oh, there's not a short break. But yes, I think you probably could you probably could use one. But let me let me just uh, let me just explain what I hope is going to happen over the next you know hour or so, and then also um, tomorrow morning. So um, you will be divided into groups, and I'll put that up in, in a second. But uh, so, you know, welcome to Hackathon One. Uh, pick your own probe set. Okay. So, again, everything you need, and maybe you just want to steer your computers here uh, now. Um, if you go, go, to this, uh, go to this, you know, short URL, click on the little menu item there that says links, and then um, click on the, the Capstone course 2017. And I'll, I'll do it uh, as well um, here, just so we're and so we're at this uh, this URL. Hopefully, you see this. Okay, everything that you need for the course is going to be here, uh, or and everything that's presented is here. So you 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 can bookmark this also if you like. Uh, bookmark it for you. Oh, then how's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, if also if you just Google links panorama, uh, it will come up. But let me go back there. Good? Good. All right. All right. So here are the, the goals. So, so you can also you know, pull these up from that, that, that site, that sort of hackathon slides are there. But here are the goals. Is I want you to, to pick a set of probes for your own P100 assay, starting from our discovery proteomics data. You pick around 100 probes, more or less. Um, and for now, the probes are actually at the level of a phosphocyte rather than at the level of a certain phosphopeptide. That's how the data are annotated, or at the level of, of phosphocytes. So there may be multiple phosphopeptides that have gone into the quantification of, of a single site. Uh, so to do this, um, again, you're going to be in groups. Decide among yourselves a guiding principle for how you will pick probes. 
and it can be anything. I'll, I'll give you some starter help at, at the end. Um, and then uh, use R or Excel or whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I know there's been a lot of R training, so I'm hoping you'll flex those R muscles, uh, but you can really use anything you want uh, to work with the data. And then um, at the end, what you're going to come up with is, is to provide a list of your 100 or so uh, probes for comparison with the other groups and the P100 probes, and then we have uh, another kind of uh, nifty evaluation that, that we'll do. So what you'll need uh, is our um, the source data. And so now there are three different versions of the source data that you could, you could have. One is um, what I would call the unfiltered data. So it, that's every site that we detected, even if it was only detected in one experiment. I don't recommend starting from here, but if you, if you want to, uh, you can go ahead. The second um, version of this data is, is filtered, where we picked only those um, sites that were observed in three quarters of the experiment. Um, and then we have a third version of that with the imputed, which is the same as the filtered set, except we filled in all the missing values with numbers drawn from a random distribution based on that particular phosphor site's behavior across the, the remainder of, of the experiments. Okay. You need a method of reading the data. You can use R. You can use uh, Excel. You need to come up with some kind of method of grouping and or choosing the probes. And then at the end, you have to be able to write a CSV file, which is a standard format, so that uh, we all come up with, a, with probe lists that we can feed into some of our, our downstream evaluation functions. Okay. Um, so what we'll, one of the, the metrics that we'll look at is your ability to separ separate replicates, uh, the bioreplicates of samples, from non-replicates based on the probe sets that, that you've chosen. Um, and we'll look, as I mentioned, comparison to the P100 probes, and then we'll just sort of see if we came up, is there any single probe that we all came up with. I'll be surprised if, if the numbers actually won, um, but, but we'll see. Uh, maybe that maybe we will, um, uh, you know, find the, the super best set of probes out of this. And I, I will say, uh, you know, I'm being a little bit uh, a mercenary here because this is sort of crowdsourcing uh, a, a, a task here, right? I can see what are all the cool solutions to these problems. I hope it's fun, uh, but I get to learn something at the end too. Okay. Uh, some additional quick notes on the data. All the numbers that you're going to see in these data matrices are ratios of the treatment um, to a DMSO control, and that's merely the SILAC ratio that was measured uh, in the experiment. All the ratios have been log two transformed, so they're sort of symmetrical about, about zero. Um, they are not uh, row normalized. They're, most of them are sort of naturally centered around uh, a log two of zero, but you may consider uh, row median normalizing or z-scoring uh, rows. Hopefully that's something that you, you've become familiar with. Um, and then I want to explain a little bit, and this is more for your reference, about the file format that these ratios are in, because we're going to encounter it um, again and again. It's a very nice, um, flexible fi file format called GCT. It's a tab-delimited file, so you could just yank it into Excel, drag and drop it into Excel, and it, and it should open there or um, import it as such. But the thing I like about it is it, it's good at containing uh, matrix data, but it keeps all metadata together with the, the values in the matrix as well. And so uh, along the top, there'll be metadata uh, about the samples. So as I was showing you the heat map earlier, I was showing you the sort of cell line and, and um, drug treatment and biorep. It'll keep that there. Uh, it'll keep metadata about the analytes. In this case, it'll be the probe names and the, the phosphor site in particular over there. I'll tell you what the field names are, and there's some other cropped up, up at, at the top. Um, we have uh, in the code base that we're providing here uh, on that, that home page for the, the course, there's something called p100processing.r. Uh, we have a code base that you can use to access this file, and there's some reference information in here that will ho hopefully make you be efficient in that. So, uh, but the one, the one caveat is you might need to install this package in R called JSON Lite if you haven't already done so. Um, you just need to install it once. You don't need to do this every time, but the, the code is now dependent on this library. Uh, and so if you want to simply read in data 
from a GCT file, we provide this function called PCT, uh, P100 provide GCT list object from file. And then you can pick any of those flavors of the source data that, uh, that I had mentioned there and just assign it to, to a data object. This, uh, this data object has parts. Don't, don't worry about taking notes because all these slides, again, are sort of, they're, they're there for you. Um, and I'll go back to that. Um, all, uh, this is the kind of structure of the data object. If you, if you do what I described there, um, the data object that returns has these multiple parts in it. If you get data object dollar sign DT, it's the data table. It will have, uh, it will contain IDs for the rows and it will contain IDs for the columns, otherwise known as call, call names and row names in, in R. It will also contain another uh, sort of data frame that is the, uh, the header information, the, which is the metadata about the samples. Um, it will also contain a data frame called uh, surviving row annotes, which is the information about the row. Um, and then if you want to, uh, all, the, all the field names are actually assigned as the, either the row names here or the, or the column names, or the row names, or actually row names here and column names here. Um, that's also assigned. Uh, in those matrices. Uh, so um, let me uh, sort of explain a little bit further. The, the, the call names are sample IDs and the row names are probe IDs. They have a certain kind of um, format that looks like this. The, the prevention of things kind of a cell line, underscore treatment, underscore bio rep. So it might look like this, MCF7, captive cell one. Or a probe ID format will look like an ID number, which is just an internal identifier, a gene name, and then a phosphor sequence. So something like this. This is just made up. One, two, three, four. RPS six is the gene. S one twenty three is the phosphor sequence. So one twenty three. So ah, uh, now I'm going to take a, a quick a quick little detour. We have a really nice uh, piece of software that's been uh, developed at the Bird Institute called Morpheus, and it's um. It's a heat map viewer, uh, but so much more. So, um, uh, so in fact, what I've done for you is, uh, if you go to this page, I've I've made um, a sort of pre-made Morpheus data package for you that contains the data, uh, it, these sort of filtered and missing values, imputed version of the of the source data. So, if you were to um, to just Download this file, and then if we go to Morpheus, which uh, um, the URL is here, software.broadinstitute.org/morpheus, or again, if you Google Morpheus Broad, it will undoubtedly be the first thing that that, that comes up. So, uh, so I've downloaded this this uh, this Morpheus file. Oops. It, the file itself is a is a JSON file. Uh, all you need to do is is uh, drag and drop this JSON file onto Morpheus, and it will uh, load the heat map that's been nicely colored and sort of has has what I think you'll want in terms of the the header information in terms of samples, um, cell ID. Uh, I didn't put BioRep there, but you can you can certainly. Uh, expose by a rep if you want. Um, very, very quick brief tour of Morpheus. Um, if you want to change things about the appearance or change which annotations are, are shown for the rows and the columns, you would use this little gear thing. Um, simply open that and you can, you can change your color scale, your color scheme. Um, the one I've picked here is just one that I, I tend to use. And then if you go to the annotation tab, you can sh you can pull out whatever annotations you want from there. If I wanted to say um, expose something else here, the sort of PERT ID, which uh, is a sort of code for a chemical code for what we have, or the simple the, the sample ID, which is this uh, this sort of convention of, of underscore combination that, that I described earlier, you, you can do that. Quite easily, and then 
don't worry, if you want to use this tool, Lev and I will be here sort of circulating, or at least I'll be here uh, circulating a little bit to help with that. So that's, that's merely apparent stuff, but something that's very powerful that it can do, it, it really just the touch of a button. So if you pull down this tool menu, you can um, go and do all sorts of clustering, whether you want to do hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, um, it, it's right there. If you just want to very quickly cluster these data using, using Pearson correlation, um, you, you can do that. You can cluster columns, you can cluster rows, you can cluster both of them. Um, Kind of just see what's in there. Maybe this is one way that one would consider, uh, you know, assigning probe groups. It may take a while. This is a sort of fairly large data set, but in fact, it's done it, and then it could be done to grams. Um, so there's all kinds of fun things there that, that you can play with, and then of course you can uh, you can either save your data set or save the session, which is this not only the whatever you've done to it, but the view that you've created. And, and that, in fact, that's what I'm giving you as a kind of entry point is this, um, this session here. Um, so that was our brief detour there. Let me just quickly go back to just a few more slides uh, before you get started. Um, right. So, okay, so that, that's Morpheus for you. Uh, and importantly, this is the desired output format in, in a simple CSV file. Right, it's just the first, it's a, it'll be a one column CSV file. Uh, the, the top thing should have the header of just the word probes, all low, lowercase. And then the entries below it should be drawn from the row names in the, in the data set that I provided to you in this convention. Uh, so basically, it's kind of pseudocode for what, what I think you would do. Um, you might load in the data object. You would extract the, the data table here um, from the object. You would maybe have a function, do something to pick some probes from the numeric data, and that would return uh, a matrix with fewer rows than the input matrix, hopefully, uh, around 100 or so. And then all you would need to do is generate a list, list um, where the probes equals the, the row names of whatever you return from your function. But that's one pseudo code way of doing it. Again, you, you could do it in Excel. You could do it in a text editor. You could do it any way you want. You could do it almost directly from, from Morpheus. Um, and then at the end, you just want to write out the CSV uh, that looks like something like that. Importantly, if you're writing CSVs from R, Make sure that you invoke this parameter option, row.names equal false, otherwise it does something funny. Okay. All right. CSV query one false. Good. See, I, I knew that you know everyone is gonna learn something from this. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, you know, I think putting you in groups, well everyone's gonna learn a ton of, of new tricks from one another. So. Uh, and so finally just some ideas to get you started, how you might go about picking probes. And, um, and I, I do want, want you to spend some time thinking about it before you, you get started because tomorrow when we have a discussion about the results, I'm gonna ask you to describe your, for each group to describe their motivating strategy. So, uh, so think about it. So um, you could cluster, as I've shown you, there are a lot of flavors of clustering. I, I expect that you've learned about some of them earlier this week. You could look for probes that have high variance or so, some variance characteristic that seems appealing um, if you think uh, that's a way to do it. You could do something like marker selection. Um, you want to pick certain probes that typify responses to certain drugs, for example. Um, you could use prior knowledge. You could start uh, going through Unipro and Googling all these phospho sites and stuff and say, oh, uh, that one sounds good or that one has my favorite gene. Uh, you could just look at the profiles and say that one looks pretty uh, and pick by eye, if you will. Um, and you can pick randomly if you want to as, as sort of an exercise. In fact, we will compare uh, to picking randomly and see if we can beat picking randomly uh, at, at the end. So, so those are some ideas. Uh, so here's what I propose is uh, I'll answer some questions, take a short break, um, and then um, I'll have posted up 
the, the groups that we want you to sort of self-organize into and then just sort of find spots around here, kind of huddle up, get to know who each other are. If you don't, by now, of two weeks of this course, but uh, if you don't, you'll, you'll hopefully meet some more people uh, get, and get going. I'll be around to kind of circulate, answer further questions, and then we'll continue doing this tomorrow morning before we sort of wrap up and, and present our results to, to one another. Sound good? Okay, well, then I'll put up the, the group posting, which Mina ha, has uh, done, so she deserves all the credit or blame. As, as <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> but but again, yeah. Yeah. But but also, I just want to emphasize that while we want to encourage you to use R in the things that you've been working on um, this week, you don't absolutely have to. There there are other ways that you can do this, and part of it is uh, part of what I want to hear tomorrow is is how you got to where you got at the end. Not only the motivation, but what you actually had to do to get there and the roadblocks that you encountered uh, along the way. I'm sure that the, the, there will be plenty of roadblocks along the way. Um, and I think we can all learn a lot from that. So, yeah. Um, so these will be the groups. And let's just say as a rough rough organizing, we'll have sort of groups one, two, three, and those approximate geographic locations and four, five, six uh, in those geographic locations. Once you get, um, you, you know, you form your group, maybe you, you can spread out around the room, or I don't know if there are other rooms available. But take, you know, 10, 10 15 minutes to refresh yourselves, and then we'll have fun. <laughs>